I read a story about a baker, and this baker, he would get up every morning. He would mix up the dough for the bread. He would knead the dough for the bread. He would bake the bread. He would pull the bread out of the oven and package the bread. He then would sell the bread, but he never ate the bread. You know, I'm afraid that there are many Christians like that about the bread of life, the Word of God. You see, the Word of God is the bread of life. And it's not enough just to know about the Word. It's not enough just to hear the Word. It's not enough just to be around the Word. It's not enough just to carry the Word. But we must let the Word of God get into our hearts and come out through our lives. When you and I were saved, God did a great, magnificent work in your heart and life. At that very moment when you trusted Christ to be your Savior and Lord, the Holy Spirit moved in your heart and imparted new life to you. You were born again. You were regenerated, made alive. At that very moment when you believed on Christ, you were justified. Your position before God changed from an enemy to one of His children. Now, since you've been saved, God is still working progressively in your heart and life. He began a good work into you, and that work is to take you from a normal human being and to radically transform you over time from the inside out to reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, to be just like Jesus and it's not something that happens always in a split second, but it happens over time progressively as the Holy Spirit works. We call that process sanctification. In doing that, God uses His Holy Spirit. He works in our heart and life. And He is working, moving us to be more like Christ. God not only uses His Holy Spirit, but He uses circumstances. He uses all the circumstances of life, those things that we like, those things that we dislike, and He's using them to conform us to the image of Christ, to transform our lives. And He uses godly people. I'm sure many of you could tell of many godly people that's been in your life that God has used to point you and to push you and to motivate you on down the path of Christ likeness. But another thing that God uses is His holy word to transform our lives. You see, God's word was not only given to us to inform us about God, but it was given to us also to transform our lives to make us mature believers that reflect the glory of Jesus Christ. I want to bring you a message this morning that I've titled Transformed by the Word. Transformed by the Word. And this morning I want to go away from Daniel and look in the book of James. The book of James, if you will. James chapter number 1. James chapter number 1. And let's begin reading with verse number 21. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, feel free to follow along on the screen. James chapter number 1, verse Number 21, the Bible says, Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But who he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, 
and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks himself is religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. This one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Here in this passage of Scripture, James gives to us some actions that you and I must take in order for God's Word to take a transforming effect in our heart and lives. I'm interested, what about you? And knowing what you and I are to do in order that God's Word might have a full transforming effect in our hearts and lives. Number one this morning. If you want God's Word to have a transforming effect in your life, then number one, prepare for the Word. Prepare for the Word. Notice verse 21. James says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. The idea to lay aside means literally to get rid of, to take off, to strip away, to put away to get rid of it. Uh, this uh, phrase has the idea of taking off dirty clothes so that you can put on clean clothes. And James here is saying that we are to strip off, to remove, to put away all filthiness. That speaks of moral filth, literally any sin in our lives. And then he goes on to say overflow of wickedness. The word overflow means an abundance, a surplus, excessive wickedness in our lives. And the idea there is any sin, any evil, all of it, he says we are to put it off in order to prepare for the word. The idea here that James is saying to these believers is any sin from the old life, any sin from your pre-Christian state, any sin that you partook of in the old life prior to accepting Christ, if there's any of that hanging around, if there's any of that remaining in your life, separate yourself from it, remove it, take it off and put it away. Not only remaining sin, but the idea there is of reoccurring sin. You know, we still have that old nature. We still have that sinful attitude that will rise up. We still have that sinful, those sinful desires that will come up at times. We still have uh, those tendencies to drift back into the life of an unbeliever. We still have that that will pop up in our hearts, in our minds from time to time. There's always the allurement of the world that calls to that old nature within. James is saying not only any remaining sin, but any reoccurring sin that seems to be difficult or challenging in your life, strip it off, put it away, get rid of it to prepare for the Word of God. I think about... Uh, how that sin in the believer's life can be destructive to our progress. You know, sin cuts off our relationship with God where we're not able to pray and talk to Him as we can when sin is confessed. Sin affects our relationship with other believers. Sin even affects our own heart and causes us to be in a state of unrest. He's saying remove anything destructive to the Christian life, anything that's holding you back from growing as a Christian, and anything that's displeasing to God. I'm reminded of that scripture over in Hebrews chapter number 12, where the writer of Hebrews says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, let us run the race that is set before us, and let us lay aside the sin which doth so easily beset us. We all have our struggles. We all have our temptations. And James is saying, lay it aside. Get 
rid of it, to clean your heart out and to prepare for the Word. You know, when I think about planting a garden, uh, I know that there is a movement today to do what's called permaculture, where you don't till up the soil. You merely uh, scratch the dirt a little bit and sow the seed and just let it do its own thing. But to have a good garden that's going to produce some good crops that are going to produce, you've got to prepare the ground. The ground has to be cleaned off. The ground has to be fertilized. The soil has to be cultivated so that it can receive that seed and bring forth a crop a hundred fold. I mean, that's the same idea Jesus used, was it, in the parable of Matthew 13. He said, a sower went to sow, and he cast forth seed. It was the seed of the word. Some of the seed fell on the wayside. That's a picture of a hard heart that's resistant to the word. He said some of the seed fell on stony ground. It sprang up for a short time, but it had no depth. It was a picture of a, a, a layer of topsoil, very shallow, and a large boulder underneath it. Uh, that's the heart that's crowded out by the Word. That's the heart that uh, is not prepared for the Word. There's the heart that has the weeds and the cares of this life that choke out the Word. Yes, they receive the word, but it's in competition with other things. But then Jesus said, there's that good soul that receives the seed of the word. And that soul brings forth fruit, some a hundred, some forty, some fifty, some sixty fold. James here is telling us, using that same picture, that if we're to receive the Word of God and it's to take a transforming effect in our life. If it is to so be used of God to make us more like Jesus Christ, we've got to prepare for it. You know, when you're full of something, you can't be filled with something else, can you? Uh, that you found that out. Uh, if you know that you're going to have a big meal when you get home, you're not going to stop at McDonald's on the way, are you? No, because you would ruin your supper. And I'm afraid that many times our hearts are not prepared for the Word. Do we prepare for the Word before we come to church? Do we prepare for the Word before we sit down and read it? Do we prepare for the Word each and every day for God to speak to us? James here is telling us prepare for the Word by getting rid of sin and anything that may hinder us from receiving the pure Word. Not only prepare for the Word, but James here tells us in these verses to receive the Word. That's the next action. If you want God's Word to have a transforming effect in your heart and life, you've got to receive it. Notice with me verse 21. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of not wickedness and receive with meekness. Now the word receive there literally means to roll out the welcome mat, to open the door and welcome it in. Let your heart be fully open saying, God, I want to hear from you. I have no reservations. I'm letting you speak to my heart from your word. And he says here that we're to receive it, welcome it in with meekness. Now, some have looked at that term meekness and equated meekness with weakness. But meekness is not weakness. As a matter of fact, some of the strongest men in the Bible, such as Jesus, was a meek man. Moses was a strong man, but he was a meek man. The idea of being meek literally speaks of a large draft horse. It has all this power. It has all of this ability. But that horse is broken and subdued to its master and willing to receive orders. And so that power is restrained and used in the right way. James here is saying to us, you and I, we may have strong wills. You and I, we may have uh, abilities. You and I uh, may have, know -how, have the know-how and wisdom. 
But we're to restrain all of that and humbly submit ourselves coming under the authority of God's holy word and allowing it to speak to our hearts no matter what it has to say to us personally. Receive with meekness. That is, have the right attitude when you have the word. Some have said that the idea there is James is saying literally when you hear the Word of God taught, when you hear the Word of God preached, receive it into your heart with a teachable attitude. A teachable attitude. Uh, you know if someone doesn't have a teachable attitude, you can't help them. And so James here is realizing that if we want God's Word to help our lives, then we must have a teachable attitude. Attitude, And he goes on to say, receive it with meekness, the implanted word. Uh, there it's speaking of God's word being alive, which is able to save your souls. In other words, allow that living word to be placed in your heart and bring forth life. And the result of that is ultimate salvation of your soul. Uh, the idea there is of taking a graft out of a good, productive fruit tree and cutting a notch in an unproductive fruit tree and putting that good limb there. And then when it grows, cut the other growth from the old tree away so that that life can flow through that grafted limb. I read a story how... In Florida, a man in his backyard had an old lemon tree. And on that lemon tree, it produced some of the most bitter-tasting lemons in Florida. And so he went to a local orange grove and he purchased a, a, a limb from a good, sweet orange tree. And he took it home and he grafted that limb into that lemon tree. And when it took root and it began to grow, he cut away the old growth for the new growth. And now it is a lemon tree still, but it has a new nature that's been planted in it. And it doesn't produce old, hard, bitter lemons, but sweet, juicy oranges. That's the picture of the Word of God. He comes to you and I that have an old, calloused heart, an old nature, and when you and I receive the Word with the right attitude, with the right perspective, being pliable, being teachable by the Word, He takes that new nature within and He cuts away the old growth, the old parts of our life, and allows for the new nature of Christ to spring forth in our lives. Receive the word and let it have an effect. James here says this word is able to save your souls. Folks, the word of God is not only able to save us from eternal damnation, but it's able to save us from temporary damage in this life. You see, God's word is a life preserver for us in this stormy world. Not only if we want to be transformed by the Word, we must prepare for it. We must receive it, accept it, saying, Lord, I want you to speak to me. This is your Word. I have my ideas, I have my thoughts, but God, I want you to speak to me. And So not only receive it, but then thirdly, apply the Word. That's the third action we must take, apply the Word. Notice with me verse number 22 again. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Now James sort of gives us a little parable right here. He describes two different individuals, two different men, two different people. You could put yourself into this parable. 
he describes one man as hearing the word. He knows what the word says. He knows that he needs to make changes. But he says, ah, out of sight, out of mind. Ah, that's not for me. Ah, that may be good for so-and-so, but not for me. That's what one man does. He's careless about his spiritual state as the Word of God reflects his life. And then there's another man that James describes in verse number 25. This man here hears the Word and does something in response to what it says. He's not merely a casual hearer of the word that goes in one ear and out the other ear, but he hears the word, he takes it seriously, and he accepts what it says to his life and puts it into practice. James says that he looks into the perfect law of liberty. The idea there is to look into the word like a mirror, intently letting it reveal your inner nature, letting it reveal the flaws in your life, Letting it reveal the good and the bad. The, 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 the blessed man, he looks into the Word and lets the Word speak back to him. And then James says he not only looks intently, but he continues actively. The idea there is to make changes, to say, okay, the Word says I need to change this attitude. God help me in this way. The Word says I need to not do this action, then God help me. The Word says I need to do this in my life, then God help me. He makes changes. You know how many of you got up this morning and you walked into the bathroom and thought, my goodness, my hair is out of place. My goodness, I need to comb my hair. I need to wash my face. I need to brush my teeth. I need to take off my pajamas and put on my regular clothes. Now, you know to do that because it's out of routine. But there's one thing that reminds you and I that we need to do that every morning. And what is that? Mirror. Now, a mirror, one thing about a mirror, it doesn't lie. It always reflects exactly what's in front of it. Well, that's like the Word of God. James here says it's a mirror. It's a mirror. It reflects the truth of our life. I've heard one person say, I know that the Bible is true because the Word of God tells me exactly who I really am on the inside. And that's how it works. That's how it operates. James here is saying, if you want to be that blessed individual, don't be like the forgetful here that sees changes that needs to be made and does nothing about it. But no, be that careful man who hears and applies the Word. Constantly look into the Word and allow it to reflect what is really in your heart. Continue in it actively and remember it constantly. Constantly, day in and day out, when you're going to work, when you're going to school, when you're interacting with your kids, when you're interacting with your spouse, remember the truths of God's Word and allow it to transform every aspect of your life. Yes, in the work of sanctification, the Holy Spirit is working in your heart, but there's also that dimension where you and I must yield to the Word of God and yield to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and God uses His Word to push us and to bring us in that direction. Uh, be uh, a careful here. Let the Word of God confront us. Let the Word of God challenge us. Let the Word of God correct us. Let the Word of God cleanse us. Let the Word of God comfort us. You know, if I'm not willing to be confronted, then I'll not be corrected. If I'm not willing to be challenged, then I'm not willing to be committed. If I'm not willing to be cleansed, then I'll not be comforted. Sometimes when you remove the dirt from a scar or a, 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 an injury, it hurts. But you know, after you clean it out, you can put that healing balm there to heal it back up. 
And that's how God's holy word works. It sometimes cuts us going in and it cuts us coming out because it's a two-edged sword. But we know that ultimately healing is to come. May we apply the word. I remember in another church I served with the kids. They used to get a Bible and they would tell all the adults, hold up your Bibles. And they'd hold up their Bibles and they would sing, Get the new look from the old book. Get the new look from the Bible. Get the new look from the old book. Get the new look from God's Word. The inward look, the outward look, the upward look from the old, old book. Get the new look from the old book. Get the new look from God's Word. And if you want to be in style with heaven, you've got to get your look from this book. Amen? Apply the Word. And then finally, there's one more action that James tells us that we're to do. We're to prepare for the Word. We're to receive the Word. We're to apply the Word. Keep on applying the Word constantly. Staying in the Word, thinking about the Word, letting it work in our life. And then we're to live it out day by day. Look at verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the Word. James here is telling us that when one prepares for the Word, when one receives the Word, when one applies the Word, it's going to be evident because they're going to live out the Word in their day-to-day -day life. And he mentions, first of all, that we'll bridle our tongue. You know, the Bible says... For the out of the abundance of the heart, what is it? The mouth speaks. And whatever's in the well is going to come up in the bucket. And if the heart has not been cleansed and changed by the word, then the tongue is going to reflect that. So James says one of the ways we live out the word is by bridling our tongue. Get it under control. Subdue it under the uh, leadership of God's word. And then not only that, he says we'll live out the word by helping the misfortunate. The idea to visit orphans and widows in their trouble uh, doesn't just speak of a social visit, but literally means to see who you can help, those who are misfortunate, those who need help along life's way, and those who need the help the most here he mentions are the orphans and the widows reaching out compassionately to them. You see, when you get God's Word in your heart, you want to do what God wants done in this world. And you'll have a heart for the misfortune. And then he says here, and, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Do you see that phrase in verse 27? In other words, he's saying that a person who's living out the Word, their tongue will be under control. They're helping those in need that can't help themselves, showing compassion and pity, but they're also staying away from being morally filthy. The world here speaks of that worldly system, the ideas, the speech, the actions. The, all the different ways that the world influences and pushes us. You know, I've learned something. We are not to compare ourselves and how good we're doing to the world, but according to Jesus Christ. And so, James is telling us to live away from sin as much as possible. Don't let this world and its ways corrupt you and pollute you and to put moral blemishes in your life. Transformed by the Word. I don't know about you, but I want to get in the Word and I want the Word to get in me and let God so transform my life. Let's stand to our feet.
transformed by the word. First of all, this morning, have you yielded your heart and life to Jesus Christ? Have you trusted him to be the Savior and Lord of your life? If you'd like to do that this morning and you're not really sure how to trust Jesus to be the Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to come right now and let me pray with you. If God's speaking to your heart, would you come? Let me pray with you. All are welcome. If there be one here today and you have a burden in your life, you'd like for me to pray with you about it. You come this morning. This invitation time is for you. What's the need in your heart?